Well, we're starting a new series today called Portraits of Christ, and uh, for me, it carries a lot of, uh, what would you say, significance. I am somebody that loves going to museums. Can you turn me down just slightly, please? Or maybe it's just the feed fold back here, but just slightly, that's it. So that I can yell and everybody's not going to get scared to death. And so um, I've been really fascinated by people like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Titian, you know, Sandro Botticelli. You know, these people cause me to... <laughs> I'm going to push through on this. Yes. And, uh, you know, I can still remember the very first time I saw the Mona Lisa. I, my wife and I, we were working in Bangkok and we had sort of like a long service leave back there in, I think it was 2003, wasn't it? Something like that, 2002. We rushed into Paris, we set ourselves up, the kids were being looked after by my mother back in Bangkok and it was wonderful. And on this particular day, I wanted to go to the Louvre. Denise said, I want to go to Versailles. She had a wonderful day in Versailles. She had you know, uh, carriage rides and, you know, tea with the queen and all that sort of stuff. You know, it was wonderful. While I was rushing through the line into the Louvre, and I can still remember running to the Denon room to see the Mona Lisa. This was one of my bucket lists. And uh, I just, I, I was told and, and expected that it was only a small painting and I was expecting something much bigger, but it was small. And I got there and I can still remember, you know, looking at it. I stood there for over an hour. My, my bucket dream listed, I wanted to sit and look at it, but there's no place to sit there. And so for an hour, I just walked around. And it's true, her eyes, they follow you. And I'm walking here and I'm walking there and I'm watching all these tourists, you know, coming up and taking photographs. I made sure I took my 17 dozen photos as well. And it was just an amazing thing. And I, and I just had this desire to phone my mother and tell her. And I rang her up and she said, where are you? I said, I'm out with another woman. She said, you're in the Louvre looking at the Mona Lisa. I said, sprung. But it was, a, it was an amazing experience for me on that particular day. And uh, I, uh, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to imbibe the sense of history, the brilliance of Leonardo da Vinci, and to be honest, just to enjoy that moment. I've got a video I want to show you about another Leonardo da Vinci painting. Let's run that video now. This particular painting is referred to as Salvador Mundi, which is Latin for Savior of the World. And it is claimed to have been created and painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The painting was sold at Christie's for $450 million. It was sold to the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman. And to this day, it represents the most expensive painting ever sold in the entire world. Some say it's a fake. Others are convinced it's the work of the maestro. Some doubt, but many are convinced. Now, the discussion is more than just provenance. Where did it come from? 
There's a really revealing conflict in the authorship of this particular painting. As we think of Leonardo da Vinci, we are reminded that history tells us he was a confirmed atheist. He didn't believe in God. And I wonder, how did he conceive this haunting face of Christ? Where did the inspiration come from? Was it, was it divine insight? Did the hand of the Lord come upon Leonardo da Vinci and inspire him to paint such a moving photograph or picture? Was this creativity of his birth by revelation? Now, we know that history says he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. And there's a quote attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, um, to Michelangelo. They were both contemporaries. They both lived in Florence at the same time. When Michelangelo was creating the Statue of David, it was during that particular time that Leonardo also painted the Mona Lisa. It is also assumed that he painted the, uh, the painting Salvador Mundi at this particular time as well. So Leonardo was quoted as saying to Michelangelo, this was a public speech, Michelangelo, if I did believe in God, then she is looking down upon you with great delight as her son. The blasphemy was uh, apparent to many in the room, and uh, maybe you find yourself in a similar situation. Maybe you, you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. Maybe you would say, I, I don't know if they're really, I'm an, I'm an agnostic. I believe there's something out there, but I'm not sure what it is. I'm not too sure who it is. You would be in good company if you felt this way. Many of the Renaissance painters were men of... Uh, dubious character, who continued to paint for the church. Leonardo was, of course, chief amongst them as the genius, the incredibly talented, the inventor, the, the engineer, the architect. He was also a perfectionist. In Florence, where it is presumed that the maestro painted this picture of Christ, he was in residence at the monastery of Santa Sima Annuzia. And again, the fact that he had his workshop in a monastery stands in stark conflict to his presumed atheism. How is it possible to paint such a moving piece and remain an unbeliever? Put the picture of, uh, of uh, Salvador Mundi up on the, on the screen if you wouldn't mind. As one looks at the haunting face of Christ, the, the eyes... The lips. Notice the two fingers up in blessing. Notice in his other hand he holds a, a globe. It denotes the world. Savior of the world. If one was to look closely and look at the ringlets of his hair, many would say they look exactly like the, the ringlets of hair on St. John the Baptist, also painted by Leonardo. How does God use someone like a Leonardo da Vinci? From Scripture and from my own experience, I know and I understand that the Spirit of God is at work in the world around us, and the Holy Spirit uses some of the most unlikeliest of folks. I spoke to a young man this morning on stage, and it is possible for many of us to be crippled by insecurity as we move forward in life, or as we imbibe the presence and the power of God, we find the ability to overcome the things that hold us back. Many would not believe if I was to tell you that at a, as a boy of 16, 17, I was incredibly shy and, and, and retiring and an introvert and didn't want to be in front of people in any way, shape or form. But then the Spirit of God came upon me. As I was preparing for my very first sermon at the age of 17, I recognized after practicing and rehearsing and reading it, it was, I only had three minutes. Back in those days, you had to stick to the three minutes. And so I got up after three days of prayer and fasting, a whole day of prayer and fasting for every minute that I was to speak. And every bit of time I spent practicing that message, I got up to speak and it was completely different. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord came upon me. Leonardo da Vinci painted the Last Supper. It's still on my bucket list. I want to go to Milan and I want to see that. Again, I want to sit and, and imbibe the, the genius that is Leonardo. He also painted St. John the Baptist, and he painted one of my favorites, the Virgin of the Rocks. This is hanging in the National Gallery just down here in London. 
I saw it only a number of months ago. As I walked in and I, I knew that there were loads of other people around looking at it, I waited until the room was almost empty and then I walked in. And it was like uh, the presence, I don't want to get spooky here, but almost like the presence of Leonardo da Vinci 500 years later. And I began to, to watch as he was painting. I, actually, I'm using the wrong hand. He painted with his left hand. Leonardo was no stranger to religious themes. And though it is presumed he remained an atheist, he was able to capture some of the world's most glorious moments of the life of Christ. Salvador Mundi, is it a fake? Why don't we show the photo of, uh, or the picture of Leonardo? There's no photos back there. This is his attempt at a selfie. <laughs> was Leonardo a hypocrite for painting this? Did his atheism affect his ability to do justice to the topic? This man, this genius, did he draw on the power of a world he could not see to paint pictures of a Christ he maybe didn't believe in? It is only presumed that he was an atheist. I wonder, as I've studied the life of Leonardo and all the works that he did, I really am challenged. Was he really an atheist? Did he really not believe in God? Thank you, you can take it down now. In today's world, many experience some of these very same conflicts and doubts. Is God real? Was Jesus more than just a, a good teacher, a moral person? Is the Bible a book that I can trust if, as I read it? Um, is it more than just history? Is it the living word of God? Will it speak to me and into my situations? Again, I remember I'd only been a Christian for about a week and, and I was really disturbed and I was really upset about something. And, and I remember I grabbed my, my Sunday school Bible that was like, you know, 10 years old from when I was living in the United States. And I grabbed my, my Sunday school Bible. I didn't know about how to read the Bible and I just opened it up into the book of Psalms. And it was like warm oil being poured on a troubled soul. The words spoke directly to me at that particular time and calmed my spirit. Maybe you've never experienced that. You're in good company today. We understand that people are on a journey and many people, they're, they're, they're experiencing things at different paces and we just want to encourage you. Maybe today, let's have a look at Salvador Mundi again. Maybe today, as you look into the eyes of this beautiful painting created over 500 years ago by the hand of the master, is there something there that speaks to you? Thank you. As I've said, Salvador Mundi is Latin and it means savior of the world. And you know, this, this painting bears a striking resemblance to other works of Leonardo. I've asked you to notice the, the left hand as he holds it up in blessing. And in his right hand, he holds a glass orb representing the world. Many people wonder, Leonardo was a perfectionist. When he painted the globe, why didn't he paint it to distort the, the clothing of Christ behind it? It's a glass globe, orb. Why didn't it distract or distort the, the clothing of Jesus? Why didn't his hand get distorted as, as he was holding it? What's all of this intricate sort of uh, work down the bottom is like drops of water in and condensation on the globe. The woman who restored this painting, I'll get to her in a minute, she has this remarkable theory as to why the globe does not distort the clothing of Jesus. She believes that Leonardo did not want anything to distract the viewer of who Christ is. No distortion, no distraction. And so, he painted it as it was. I'm constantly amazed by the curls, the incredible intricacy, the haunting and riveting stare of his eyes and the texture of his skin. It is suggested that Leonardo oftentimes used his right hand to mat the paint to make it look more textured leads me to a passage of scripture and, and I would like to read it to you from the message. It's in 1 John chapter 4 verses 13 to 16. 
Let me read it to you. This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him, speaking of Christ, and he in us. He's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit. Now this, this is speaking in reference, of course, to the resurrection power. You know, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken us, will quicken our mortal bodies. So it's the same spirit that gave him life that gives us life, his very own spirit. Also, we've seen for ourselves and continue to state openly that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. I wonder, did, did Leonardo in his run-up to this painting, did he, did he open the book of 1 John? Did he look at that and see Savior of the world? You know, Leonardo back in his day would have, re, would have been reading from a Catholic Bible and would have been reading it probably in Latin. Leonardo being the great educationalist, the, the genius of his day, of course he could speak Latin. Did he see Savior of the world and think to himself, Salvador Mundi, this is the painting I'm going to paint right now. But John goes on and he says, everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's son participates continuously in an intimate relationship with God. I love the turn of phrase. Participates intimately, continuously in a relationship with God. This, this whole concept of being participants in a continuous and intimate relationship with God. We know it so well. We've embraced it heart and soul. This love that comes from God. As we unpack these scriptures, we see those who decided to believe in Jesus and experience a life-transforming thing that turned their world upside down. It was an experience with this Christ. People testify of a relationship with God through Jesus, coming to this conclusion because they themselves have seen it for themselves. You know, the night I gave my life to Christ... I, I, I wasn't really somebody who prayed, honestly. But the night I gave my life to Christ, I began to pray like I've never prayed before. On the drive back from Brisbane down to the Gold Coast, that night when I went to bed, as I, as I thought about Christ, as I thought about the experience that I'd had that night, I began to pray. There was a, an inner subjective response to Jesus. I felt something. I experienced something. I was talking to somebody that I had previously not spoken to. I was now in a relationship with God. In this passage, the word Savior means deliverer or one who rescues. The word world is, a, is in a philosophical sense, denoting the moral world rather than the planet of earth. The word includes the people living in that world. The passage is, of course, speaking of Christ as Savior of the world. The scripture makes mention of the need to believe that Jesus is God's Son. We know that this is a process. We know that we understand that it takes people time. We understand there's, there's a, the inner working of the Spirit to believe in someone. Denise, when she was talking yesterday at the wedding ceremony, talked about trust and how long it takes to build up trust and how it can be destroyed in a second. It's the same with Christ. We, we grow in our belief with him. It's not one second of, I said the prayer, I raised my hand, I'm now a Christian. Well, you are, but your experience with him will continue to grow. And it will be a very subjective thing. It's like an experience. Like when, when people say to me, oh, Leonardo, he wasn't anything great. Well, you try and tell that to me. I had the experience. I was at the Louvre. I sat in front of the Mona Lisa. I saw St. John the Baptist. I saw a virgin of the rocks. I've seen them. I've experienced it. You can't, you can't change my mind. There was an internal, subjective belief structure that was being created. Let me explain this scripture with a particular application that I want everyone to hear. And you may be a Christian and you may have already given your life to Christ and that's fantastic and we, we think that's great too. But there may be people watching us today online who have not yet made that decision. Maybe the words that I'm about to share with you will help to clarify your understanding of what's going on in your own personal life. When Leonardo gave the name to this painting as Salvador Mundi, Savior of the World, as we read it in conjunction with 1 John chapter 4, we realize something very powerful, and it's this, and listen carefully. Salvation is available to everyone. 
We are not broken down by political barriers, conservative, liberal, labor, green, UKIP. We're not broken down by political barriers, be they Republican or Democrat. Jesus loves everybody. And the, you know, the Bible's really clear that there was nobody excluded from Jesus' realm. If you live in the world, you too can believe. There is no disqualifier for salvation. The scripture says to simply believe or, or trust in and adhere to. Have faith in Christ. Simply accept him as your savior. Whoever believes, the Bible says. And the whosoever means there is no one disqualified based upon gender, skin color, religious background, or previous behavior. Picking up a, a taxi on my way to a church on the, uh, in Sydney a number of years ago, the taxi driver said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the church. And he says, I'll drop you off at the front. If I was to come in, the walls would fall down. I said, why would you think that? He said, oh, they're all hypocrites in there anyway. I said, well, you should come in. You should feel at home. And the church is full of hypocrites. We're all there. We've all done stuff that we preached against. Hey, yeah. be honest. Based on your previous behavior, there's, there's, no, there's no disqualifier. If we are willing to confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yeah. That means there is nothing that you can do to disqualify yourself from this great salvation or his love for you. There is nothing you can do. Isaiah 118 in the King James Version. Forgive me for quoting it in the old King James, but it just sounds so good. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I still remember the night I gave my life to Christ. Up in Brisbane... It was the atmosphere, it was, it was the music, it was the fact that there were just normal people around me. You know, there was nobody wearing monk cowls and, you know, nun outfits and, you know, there was none of that. It was just normal people, normal people, pretty girls, you know? It wasn't hype. I wasn't hypnotized or, or given precognitive suggestions. I wasn't being duped. I was fully in control of all of my rational abilities. It wasn't some new age rant. That night, I came face to face with Jesus. The man preached God's word about what everyone needs to know about Jesus Christ, and I needed to hear it. And you know what? As he preached about Jesus, Jesus revealed himself to me that night. I came to the front of the, of the church and, and I said this prayer of salvation. And I know this is not the, the same experience that many have had, but it was like the power of God came upon me. I began to weep and weep and weep as I'd never wept before. When I finished my crying, I felt like I was clean. I felt like something had happened deep on the inside of me. My perceptions changed, my behavior changed, my attitudes changed. My life was different from that day forward. In the book of Romans 10, verses 8 to 11, but what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, rescued, delivered. For it is with your heart that you believe. This subjective instrument of our body Unable to touch, not the physical heart, but the internal organism. It is with your heart that you believe. You're justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. This means anyone. You may identify as an unbeliever, an agnostic, or even an atheist. But that can all change in a second of time. There is no discrimination. This invitation is open to anyone. There is no bias, no favoritism, no inequality. This is an invitation to the whole world. No one is banned from this invitation to believe because Jesus is the Savior of the world. The restorer of this painting, Salvador Mundi, Diane Modestini, an Italian lady, she had a moment of revelation. 
Now, she wasn't sure that, that this painting had been painted by the maestro. And for five years, she worked on restoring it. You know, in, the, in a similar way, we each experience a revelation too that Jesus is the Savior of the world. But the coming to this revelation is a process. For her, it was five years. For others, if you, maybe five decades. A revelation, that internal experience of truth, is the power behind our belief. It is our aha moment where truth breaks through the barrier of our doubt. So for over five years, she worked on restoring this painting. She employed the science of restoration. She was a very talented, educated, uh, incredibly um, um, smart lady. The rigorous rules of determining provenance and her own talent to determine that this was either a Leonardo or not were put to the test. She, as she began to uncover the painting, removing the layers of varnish, she noted the strokes of the paintbrush were from a left-handed person. She noted the use of the painter's right hand to smear the paint to make the texture more uh, lifelike. She compared the ringlets of Christ's hair and discovered they were a perfect match to the hair of St. John the Baptist in a painting that was very clearly a, a da Vinci. In the end, it was an internal experience. What she said was, as she was fixing the... Maybe show the painting again of Salvador Mundi. Up on the screen over here to the uh, left-hand side, you'll notice a bit of a darker coloring around the lips. She began to, to work on that, and she began to see how the lip, the, the, the lip was connected to the upper lip. And she began to, to notice that this was similar to the Mona Lisa, to St. John the Baptist. As she began to remove the varnish and begin working on the, the, the destroyed bits, she began to see something that she had never seen before. She received a revelation, I believe, as a professional art restorer with decades of experience. She looked, she looked, she looked. And at one moment, huh, she burst into tears. <laughs> she said, no one could have created this apart from Leonardo. I challenge you to look closer as well. Look around you, maybe into the eyes of Jesus as painted by Leonardo. I encourage you to look up to see the universe and the stars. I encourage you to watch a sunset or a sun, sunrise. Look at the clouds, experience the rain, feel the rays of the sun upon your skin, and then tell me there is no intelligent creator of the world. Look at your own body and its thousands of daily functions and say there is no God. Talk to me about love and try and explain that there is no God. Watch the birth of a child and tell me it's not a miracle. Watch a bird in flight and tell me there is no God. Observe the waves of the sea. Hear the roar of the sea and tell me there is no God. Study the laws of physics and tell me there is no God. Historians tell us that Leonardo was an atheist. But you know something? I really wonder... Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. I love this. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his chambers, like a champion rejoicing on his run of his course. It rises to one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And do you know something? We are surrounded by this proof. The existence of God cannot simply be ignored. I encourage you to take a closer look around you. Look closer. The reality of God is plain enough. Take the time for a long and thoughtful look at what God has created. You know, I remember my last trip to Florence. It was a summer's night in Florence. And, and a summer's night in Florence is like attending a surprise party for children. You stand stunned by what, God, what colors God will play with this evening. Gold, violet, shades of green decorating the evening sky, moving into deep purples, reflecting a dying sun with distant mountains that surround Florence in repose, bringing the city into sharper focus. These colors delighted my senses. God smiled my way as he holds up his paint-smudged fingers and said, hey, look what I've just done. People have always seen what their natural eyes can't see, the eternal power and the mystery of God's divine being. Allow the knowledge and the understanding of God to touch your 
in her senses. And in doing so, I simply believe that Jesus is indeed Savior of the world. Salvador Mundi. Thank you.